Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to ramp up the complexity a little bit. We'll be talking about reinforced concrete modeling. As usual, let's start with a static structural analysis. Let's open up our engineering data, and I'm going to create three new materials for this analysis. So I'll start off with a rebar. I'll also create a material called bearing and a third material called concrete. Now, we'll start with the bearing material. The bearing material is going to be the bearing pads that supports my structure and also that I apply load through. So it's going to be a very soft material that will help our analysis converge and it helps avoid stress concentrations where you put the load. So our bearing material is going to be linear elastic. We'll use isotropic elasticity. It's going to have a relatively low modulus and I'm going to change all my units to PSI here. Our modulus is going to be 10,000 PSI. So again, a very small modulus and it'll be effectively incompressible. So it has a Poisson's ratio of about 0.5. So 499999, we'll round it off to 0.5 right there. So having exactly 0.5 is a perfectly incompressible material. We'll skip the concrete for now. We'll go to rebar. For our rebar, we'll also use isotropic elasticity. And I would also like this to yield. So I'll add a bilinear isotropic hardening. For my modulus for steel, we'll put this in PSI. It's 29,000 KSI, so I'll add three zeros to the end of that for PSI. Poisson's ratio is about 0.3. Our yield strength will be 60 KSI. So I'll change this to 60,000 PSI. And then the tangent modulus, I'm going to make this a relatively small number. Let's just call it 1 million for our yielding behavior right there. Now let's define our concrete properties. So for concrete, we'll still use an isotropic elasticity, but concrete doesn't yield in a traditional sense like other materials or like any kind of metal. We'll scroll all the way down here and we'll pick out one of our geomechanical materials that has strain softening. So the two most common options for concrete are going to be Drucker Prager or Menetre Willem. I'm gonna choose Menetre Willem here and drag that over. And we can see that Menetre Willem will allow us to assign a compressive strength, a tensile strength, because obviously they're different for concrete, and also a biaxial strength and a dilatancy angle. Now, if I click on this option for the Menetre Willem, you can see I can also add softening behavior as a sub option. So we'll add that as well. And we'll need to define some other properties that tells us how our stress strain curves look. Now, the concrete material in ANSYS has a lot of different properties that we need to assign. So I'm going to break them down and talk about each of them individually. First off, let's start off with our strength. That's going to be our peak compressive strength here. And for this problem, I'm going to assume 6 KSI concrete. So if I need to do that in metric, that's about 41.4 megapascals. Next thing that I need to do is I need to assign a modulus. So the modulus I will calculate based on my strength per ACI 318.19, and that is the modulus is 57,000 times the square root of F prime C in units of PSI. So substituting our value in, that's 57,000 times the square root of 6,000 gives us a modulus of 4415000 PSI. Now the Poisson's ratio is not specified in ACI 318, but it usually falls within a pretty narrow range. And FIB model code 2010 suggests that this is about 0.20. Next, we'll define the modulus of rupture, which is going to be the tensile strength, which is, of course, much less than our compressive strength for concrete. According to ACI, we can approximate this modulus of rupture as 7.5 times the square root of F prime C, again, in units of PSI. So if I substitute that in, we'll have 7.5 times the square root of 6,000 is equal to 580 PSI. Next, we need our biaxial compressive strength, this is not specified in ACI, but it is specified in the FIB model code. It's denoted as F2C2, and the commentary says that we can approximate this as 1.2 minus F prime C divided by 1000 times F prime C, where this F prime C right up here must be defined in megapascals. So if we do that, F2C2 is equal to 1.2 minus 41.4 megapascals divided by 1,000 times, again, 6,000 PSI will get us 6,950 PSI. Now, the dilatancy angle can vary quite a bit, and according to common practice, it's usually somewhere between 15 degrees and 30 degrees. For this example, I'm going to use 30 degrees, 
but you can always try it a different number if you're finding that convergence is a little weird or if you have some specific material data that you want to match. Now we need to define our softening behavior, which tells us what our stress strain curve looks like. So first of all, we need our strain at our peak compression. So that's gonna be the point right here, the strain. Again, this is documented in a table in the FIB model code, and it's approximately equal to 0.0024 for the strength of concrete that we have here. Now ANSYS doesn't actually want the total strain there, they only want the plastic strain at that location. So to calculate the necessary plastic strain, I'm going to subtract from my total strain, the elastic component, which is F prime C divided by EC. So therefore this is 0 0.0024 minus 6,000 PSI divided by my modulus, which was 4415000. And this strain is about 0 0.001. Lastly, I've assumed a variety of parameters. These are assumed either to relatively match realistic curves or to help us with convergence. So first thing that we need is an ultimate plastic strain in compression. That's the plastic strain at this point right here. I'm assuming it's about 1%. Then we also need a relative stress at nonlinear hardening, 0.4. What that means is that we have a transition from linear behavior to nonlinear behavior at 40% of our strength right there. Finally, I have a residual compressive relative stress. That's the stress that our stress strain curve ends at, and it's assumed to just go out straight from there, and that's at 20% of my strength. Now the plastic strain limit in tension, I've assumed that's also 1%, so that's my plastic strain at this point out here. That is frankly a bit unrealistic, but having a very small plastic strain limit in tension will hurt your convergence quite badly. So making this a larger number helps us converge if you want to sit around for a long time or have a supercomputer, you can obviously make that smaller and more realistic. In this example, it's going to be a relatively large number. Finally, we have a residual tensile relative stress. That's saying that the stress at this point here is 20% of our peak stress where we had our modulus of, of rupture. All right, so let's enter all those material properties into our ANSYS table here. For my Young's modulus for concrete, You'll notice I've already changed all my units to PSI. This is 4415000. Poisson's ratio is approximated as 0.2. Uniaxial compressive strength, 6,000 PSI. Tensile strength is 580 PSI. And my biaxial strength was 6950. And my dilatancy angle is 30 degrees. Scrolling down, we see our plastic strain. Again, that's plastic strain at uniaxial compressive strength was 0.001. And my ultimate effective plastic strain and compression is 0.01, so 1%. My relative stress at the start of nonlinear hardening was 40%, so 0.4, and my residual stress is 20%. My plastic strain limit in tension, we're saying that's 1% strain, which again is a bit unrealistic, and my residual stress for tension is going to be 20% of my modulus of rupture. Moving on to geometry, I've already set my units to inches, so let's set the sketch plane to XY and we'll draw a cross section. Our cross section will be a 10 inch wide by 16 inch high rectangle. We'll go to 3D view, and I want to extrude this rectangle 120 inches this way. So effectively, this is going to be half of my beam length. I'll use symmetry on this side right here. I will apply load at midspan and I'll have two supports on the ends. For my loading and for my boundary conditions, I wanna place some bearing pads there. So to do that, I'm going to split the top face. So we'll go to design, we'll split top and I'll split it six inches from the end over here. And then I'll rotate this around and split it six inches from the opposite end down here. And now I'm going to pull those sections out by two inches, so we have a two inch thick bearing pad there and a two inch thick bearing pad here. Now, because I want to assign different material properties to this beam, which will be concrete, and the bearing pads, which will be an elastomer, I need to also split the body. So we'll go to split body here. I'll select the body I want to split, select the cutting plane, and then click outside so that you keep both sides of your plane. And I'll do the same thing down here. I'll select my body, select my cutting plane, click outside so you keep everything. And that will then define your two bearing pads. Now we need some rebar. So to draw a rebar, I'll go to sketch. I wanna make a line. Now doing a line will prompt you to select your sketching plane. I'll sketch right on the face here. 
And I want to make sure that I click Layout Sketch, so I'm sketching lines, not solid objects. And I'm going to click here at the bottom, I'll go 2 inches up, and then go 120 inches over. I'll hit Escape twice, so that I can select this little line over here and delete it, because I don't really need that. And now I can go to 3D View. Now currently that line is right on the face of my beam, that doesn't make sense, that should be embedded within the beam, so I'm going to move that line back. So to move the line, you move actually the, the selection plane right here, so I'll select my plane, I'll move it in this Z direction two inches back. So now functionally that line is embedded two inches over and two inches up from this corner. Now let's assign that a profile for a beam, so I want a circular profile. And I'll open up my beam profiles here. Here's my circle. I'll edit that beam profile. I want to change the radius. Let's say this is a number six bar, so I'll have a radius of 0.375. That's a three quarter inch radius. And I'll close out of that. I'll go back to my stru structure tab there. I want to create a beam, so I'll create and I'll select my line. And then you can click out. So it's hard to see, but that line has effectively been created as a beam. You can look over here, you can see there's a beam. I have one beam circle here. Now I'd like to copy that beam. So I want four bars there on the bottom. So I'm gonna go to design here and linear pattern. I'll select my rebar. I'll select the direction in which I wanna copy it. And then I'll say I want four of them spaced at two inches. So it'll give you a preview here to accept the preview. We will also need to hit the check mark here. And now it has four rebar down at the bottom of my section right there. And that's it for geometry. So let's jump over to ANSYS Mechanical. Now in Mechanical, first thing we'd like to do is put a symmetry region right here. So I'll do symmetry. And then in my symmetry, I want to create a symmetry region. I'll spin this around. I'll select both of these faces here and apply that. And my symmetry normal is actually the Z axis here, not the X axis, so I will need to change that. Now let's assign some material properties to my geometry. You'll notice all these have a question mark, they don't have a material definition yet. So for this solid, I need to assign that as concrete. These two solids are the bearing pad, so I will assign that to element bearing. And then these three are all rebar, so let's give that material rebar. And I'll also change the model type from beam right here to reinforcement. So when that's modeled as a reinforcement, it will automatically be embedded within whatever solid that it's attached to so that it functions effectively as a rebar inside my concrete. Next thing we'll do is we'll check our connections. If I open up my connections, we'll see right here that I have two contact regions that have been automatically created for me. These connections are between the beam and the bearing pads, again, those are automatically created by ANSYS. If it sees attached geometry in space claim, it will try to automatically connect them. Always double check those, sometimes they're wrong. In this case, it is correct, so we are good to go. We have good connections there. Next, we'll do a mesh. I'm gonna do a relatively simple mesh, so I'm just gonna change my element size default to two inches. And I'm going to do linear elements just to make this a little bit more efficient. And then I'll hit generate. And there's our mesh, and it's looking pretty good and regular, so I like that. Let's move on to our static structural analysis. I'm going to create a fixed support at this bearing pad right over here, so that's one of our supports. To apply my load, I'm actually going to be doing a displacement control test here, so I'll place a displacement on this location, and it'll be in the Y direction. Let's say it goes down by 1.2 inches. Now let's change our analysis settings. First, let's turn on large deflection. I don't think I'm going to have very large strains, but it's always more accurate to do so, especially when you're already doing nonlinear analysis anyway. So we'll turn that on. Auto time stepping, I'm also gonna turn this on. I'll start with 200 stub steps, and my minimum stub steps will be 200, and my maximum stub steps, let's overshoot, and let's say I need 10,000 of those. So that's a better guarantee that it's going to make it all the way to the end, even if it takes a very long time. Last thing that I would like to do is I'll click on solution here. You'll notice it says beam section results no here. Let's change that to yes. If you leave it as no, it will not give you the output for the rebar themselves. So saying yes, it will also give you rebar output. And before I get this started, let's create a couple objects for results. Let's create a total deformation. Let's create a strain. I'd like an equivalent total strain. So that's gonna give me my total strain. 
And let's also get stress, and I'll get two normal stresses. I'd like to get my normal stress in the X direction, and I'll rename that as normal stress X. And then I'll also want my stress in the Z direction, and I'll rename that normal stress Z. Lastly, I'd like to know what my reaction force is at my support here, so I'll do a probe force reaction, and let's do that at my fixed support. Now we should be ready to go, so let's hit solve. And if you want to watch the solution proceeds, we'll click on solution information here. And change solver output, which is not usually very interesting, to force convergence, and we'll see the force convergence go. Now, this may take quite some time. It will do a lot of iterations, so we'll be back after however long it takes. And here we are at the end. That took me about 20 minutes to complete the analysis. So let's look at some results. I'll start with a def directional deformation just to see if everything worked out. You see there's a lot going on right here in the bearing pads. I don't really want to see that. I don't really care about those results, so I'm going to hide them. So I will hide these bodies and I will go down to my directional deformation and I'll right click here and I will adjust to visible so that it is modeling what we see right here. And of course I plotted the wrong results. That's X axis deformation. I actually want the Y axis deformation. So let's do Y and hit solve to get the real results that I want. All right, and I'll have to rescale it here. So I'm going to right click and adjust to visible much better. So here we can see we have zero displacement here about 1.2 inches on the far side. So we can also look at our normal stresses in the Z direction. This can tell you your stresses within the concrete there. So that's my normal stress in the concrete. Z is in this direction. One thing that I like to do is you can change the values on the scale. And I like to turn one of these values to zero precisely so that we can see now anything that's red is in tension and then anything orange or different is now in compression. So we can see here is our compression and then tension regions here and here just as we'd expect. On top, we can see this is effectively almost crushing. If I probe that, we can see that it is um, actually over my compressive strength. Um, that might be because of biaxial factors and things like that. So there is some confinement due to the bearing pad right there. So it can reach a, st a stress slightly higher than the 6000 PSI uniaxial strength. We can also check out the rebar results. Now, if I click on normal stress X, X for the rebar will be your normal stress for that rebar. It's obviously invisible because it's hidden here. So we'll once again hide our concrete. So we'll hide the concrete here, hide body, and go back down to our results for normal stress in the X direction. You can see that it's definitely yielding down here. It is above 60 KSI. So it's on the strain hardening plateau right there at my mid span. Turn my concrete back on, so we'll show body. And now we'll look at our equivalent total strain. The equivalent total strain, it doesn't look like much is going on here. Let's once again rescale this, adjust to visible. See if that helps us out. There we go, much better. So here we can see we have a lot of concentrated strain right here. And also on top, if I probe that on top, you can see that my total strain is in some regions getting pretty close to the peak there. It's about 0 0.2 or 0.002. Finally, let's look at our force reaction. So our force reaction right here, we can see that how it evolves with time. I do have a, a fairly strong uh, reaction in the Z direction here. That's because I did a fixed base there. So it's not a true roller connection. So this is almost doing some sort of compressive arching, if you will, where it's arching down from my load to my support here. But we can see maximum over time that currently my Y force is about 17 kips upwards and my Z axis force. If you look at the maximum, you may be misled. So let's look at the minimum there of 13 kips acting in the horizontal direction. So it's a pretty sizable horizontal force because I fixed that base. So it might be in my best interest to actually make that a, a more proper roller connection, depending on what my true connection for this system is. But for now, that's an interesting result to see. And that's what we have for reinforced concrete design for today. Thank you all for watching. Please subscribe and I will see you next time.